are going to record this uh, presentation. So if you don't want to be on camera, please press the stop button on your screen. There are many reasons why we should be interested in food production on Salt Spring. Our agriculture systems can either help climate change or they can harm it. For example, some of the issues with, with the um, climate change are the greenhouse gas emissions, our food security, our crop resilience, our climate change, plant diversity, and food waste. And there's two issues that recently surprised me when I saw them. The first one was that our greenhouse gas emissions from food systems is about 21 to 37 percent. This includes, of course, land clearing, storage, transportation, chemical, fertilizer production, processing, retail, and consumption. And if we can improve our food and agricultural systems, we can help reduce greenhouse gas emissions and remove carbon from our atmosphere. The second one that surprised me was that Salt Spring provides only 10% of its food production. And this can make us vulnerable to supply disruption as well as climate change issues. But fortunately tonight, we're gonna to be hearing from three panelists that are working towards increasing food production, diversity and resilience on Salt Spring while decreasing the greenhouse gas emissions. They will be telling us how they are currently helping Salt Spring and I also hope to learn how we can help them with their projects. We will be hearing from Ann Macy, Patricia Reichert, and Kaylee Barton. I will be introducing them individually prior to their presentations. So tonight will be divided into three parts. Each speaker will have about 10 to 15 minutes for their presentation. Then we will take two to three questions from the chat. Then the next, and then we will have an interesting little poll for you to help us fill out. Then the next speaker will be will present followed by several questions and a poll. And at the end of our presentations, if there's enough time, we'll be able to continue with more questions. And if you want to ask a question, use the chat, which is at the bottom of your screen. Click on it, type in what you want, and then press return. And then um, Deborah Miller will be going through those and pulling out um, some really good chat questions. Let's go to our first speaker. This is Ann Macy, and she is currently the president of the Salt Spring Abattoir Society, and she's the current chair of the Salt Spring Island Agriculture Alliance and also of Island Natural Growers. So she's a busy woman. She was a sheep farmer in a former life in Ontario and has been involved in the organic movement in Canada and internationally for close to almost 40 years. And no longer farms, but she is working to promote local agriculture and organic food production since she came to Salt Spring 25 years ago. So retirement for Anne means managing the community abattoir. Okay, Anne, we'll listen carefully to your presentation. Thank you. And you're on mute. You got to start over here. Oh, I'm sorry about that, everybody. <laughs> Let's start again. So I'm going to be talking about the role of livestock in our community abattoir um, and that role they play in building a healthy, abundant food system. But which might seem a little odd, seeing as what you hear about all the time is how we all have to move to a plant-based diet. But I'm hoping what I have to tell you We'll, make, um, we'll provide a little more information about why I think livestock are import, important and can make a good contribution. Um, so some of these, you just heard from Bobby about the fact that over 20% of Canada's local food transmission emissions come from the food system. And here on Salt Spring, we're only, um, producing about 10% of what we eat. The rest of the food comes from the more from the industrial food system across Canada and from different parts of the world. The thing about livestock production is that it actually makes up about 30% of the emissions that come from the food system. That can be directly from the animals like the methane produced by the beef cows, which you hear about all the time or from manure storage from the 
fertilizers used on pastures, all those kinds of things. But that's just part of the story. On salt spring, our production systems are very different from um, the large scale system which feeds most of us. You'll see from the, the photographs that the ones on the right are all taken on salt spring. The two on the left are the um, where most of our food comes from. The industrial systems are designed to produce a lot of protein for, uh, for the cheapest possible amount of money and making the mo most production from the least amount of space, basically. So if you were to go to a, a local system, it's very different and it there are a lot of cost differences too, which is reflected in the difference in price. But that's what we have to do if we want to um, use livestock in a way that can help us address the climate questions. Livestock can be a primary tool for regeneration. If you have good pasture management, they can help spread fertility. They encourage healthy plant growth and carbon sequestration. They can control weeds and invasive plants. Many small farms are using pigs of disturbance agents. They break up the ground and add fertility before planting food crops or renewing pastures. They can go into the orchards, clean up the windfalls and break insect life cycles and reduce pest populations. Many of our farms here on the island have um, poultry, either for eggs or for meat. And that again is a major contributor to soil fertility, either using ch chicken tractors or via the um, when you clean out the coop for the compost pile, they break up thatch and manure, allowing new plants to germinate and control insects and other pests. And even if you don't have livestock on the farm, many of our crop farmers are bringing the products from livestock onto the farm in the form of compost, whether it's, um, sometimes it's, it might be poultry manure or other kinds of uh, compost. Sometimes it's fish fertilizer, but it's, it's still basically relying on um, livestock. So if you are a meat eater, and I know lots of people choose not to be, but those that are, and you, and if you have a bit of guilty conscience about it, it's all about the, the choices you make. So you want to look for animals that are raised on pasture with low grain input, pastures that are high in biodiversity, producers that use rotational grazing methods to build healthy soils and prevent pollution and we still have quite a lot of work to do on salt spring in that regard because the pastures here don't appear to be that productive. You also want to be buying meat from farms and processing facilities which prioritize animal welfare so where which means the animals have low stress they're free to roam able to exhibit their natural behaviors so they live a good life with perhaps only one bad moment and hopefully they didn't even notice that. You can support the development of a resilient food system on Salt Spring where small farms are integrating livestock into their production systems. So how does the abattoir come into all this? Well, if we're going to um, raise livestock, or we need process inf infrastructure here on the island or at least in the region so we can shift our reliance on a global food system and support expansion of the farming activities here. In 2004, the meat inspection regulation came in, which required that slaughterhouses be licensed in order to produce meat for sale for human consumption. We could, farmers could no longer kill the animals on the farm uh, and sell the meat. They could eat it for their own consumption, but they couldn't sell it. That meant farmers had to take livestock off island um, to Duncan or other places in order to get their meat processed. So then they had to go and pick the meat up later and it all just became a big cap hassle and quite costly. So livestock producers basically cut down, they stopped doing it and surveys showed that from 2004 to 2008, um, it was about a 50% drop. Feel 44% in sheep and cattle and 54% in chicken. So there was a studies done and basically 
building a, an abattoir on Salt Spring wasn't going to be a, a viable business proposition. There just wasn't enough animals and it was too seasonal a business. The solution was a community abattoir. So a working group got together in 2010. Um, we did a lot of community fundraising. We had to find some land. Some was offered by a local farmer and went through the TUP process and plans for the buildings were approved by the province. Construction started in 2012. The, um, the Ag Alliance kind of oversaw that construction and set up the Abattoir Society in order to manage the operations. We opened for poultry in September, um, just in time for Thanksgiving. In the following year, 2013, we got a class A license for poultry and lambs. A class A means you can slaughter and you can also cut up the meat. Um, and then by 2016, we'd made enough um, changes and expanded the facilities so we could process beef and pigs. We're quite an um, anomaly really because we're, we're the only abattoir that attempted to do all species. Um, we had a number of visits from politicians we had a cut two from the lieutenant governor, um, who at that time was a rancher herself, so was interested. And then just um, 2019, we also had a visit from the federal minister of agriculture. But basically, the abattoir has been supported by a community by uh, fundraising events at the um, full fair where we were selling burgers, the annual birthday bash. But every time we wanted a new piece of equipment or something like that, we, we looked to the community to help us out. So um, things changed dramatically in 2020 with the COVID pandemic when there was no longer any possibility for sort of fundraising activities and the demand really increased. A lot more people went away from wanted to buy local a lot more people grew their own. So we found that we had a lot more people trying to use the service than we could handle. Um, this year was exciting. We were awarded a 225,000 infrastructure grant to increase capacity and create more economic activity. Uh, whether how, well, we'll see how that plays out in the next year. But we operate with seven, uh, between seven and nine part-time staff. Um, and there's a, the board of directors do quite a lot of the management on a volunteer basis. So the numbers, um, the survey showed that in 2008, about 2,600 chickens were raised for meat on Salt Spring. So that number, since we opened the abattoir started to increase and was at about five, just over 5,000 until one producer decided not to, one large producer dropped out and decided not to continue growing and a couple of other small producers stopped growing chickens. So there was a dramatic drop in 2019, but that came right back in 2020 and we think there'll be more this year. So obviously there's renewed interest. Um, Red meat has been pretty consistent with numbers of lambs and um, that we just do a few beef and a few pigs a year. The overall impact of this, um, of the abattoir has been to increase the availability of our local food choices. Um, local meat can still be hard to find. Uh, we don't have any more the, the butcher shop which we had before but livestock I think is a very import, important part um, of food production in the island and really helps with growing all kinds of crops so it it helps with the whole resilience of the farms it increases the economic vitality uh, and viability and now um, it's also going to help with re recycling nutrients on the island we have received some money to go towards an eco drum composter and the are working with the farmland trust to locate this composter at the Burgoyne Valley Community Farm. So we're hoping with the abattoir waste and more organic materials from off island and additional carbon and feedstocks, 
we'll be able to increase the supply of compost that's available for our island farms. So a last thought, um, we often hear know your farmer. So now I'm gonna say know your butcher, know where your food comes from, know where your meat comes from. I think a consumer has the power to change a system through the choices they make. So I'll leave that with you. And if you're a meat eater, I hope you will seriously consider looking to your local farmers first. Thank you. Happy to take questions. Okay, did you hear that last part? I did. Sorry, the question just popped in. Okay. Okay, Deb, um, is there any any questions? Uh, there's one question. It says. Uh, the farms on Salt Spring or Vancouver Island are operating on a small scale like Salt Spring Island or sorry they're asking are the farms uh, operating on a small scale or is the quality of meat product produced here much higher in your opinion? Is the sorry is the quality of meat, meat produced here well I, no I think I think the quality of meat produced on Salt Spring is probably similar to the quality of meat produced on any um, small farms on Vancouver Island. But I think it's, I mean, we do have one advantage in that there's very little stress involved with getting to the abattoir because the distance is so short. And we do know that animals that are stressed, the, the meat that comes from them is, is of a lower quality is often tougher. So hopefully, that, you know, be, just because of the short distances, that's a, a factor in the quality of the meat you're eating. Um, uh, what if I, if I were to kill a deer, could I bring that deer to the abattoir? Unfortunately not, because we um, are under the meat inspection system, an inspector has to be pre present when the animal, see it live and be there when it's killed, as well as see the final product. And they do not allow us to have non-inspected meat in the same place as inspected meat. So it would be possible, perhaps, if we had a totally separate cooler to hold to hold meat, um, deer meat. The, the other trouble, though, is the hunting season is the same time as our busiest season for the abattoir in the fall. So I've, it's been, you know, unless... The, there was a, a cow with a special license or something like that, which was outside the busy time, then we could probably manage it so there was an inspected meat and, and deer meat in the facility at the same time. But currently, the way things are set up, it's not going to be possible. Um, there's a couple of questions about the, the best place to get local meat. Can you get it from farm stands or the country grocer? Anywhere else you would suggest? Um, Basically, at the minute, it's from farm stands and directly from farmers. They often um, advertise on the exchange. We did have a butcher shop for a while, but unfortunately, that closed. And we're working towards uh, something like that again in the future. Um, Natureworks and, and Country Grocer have, sometimes have local meat. And sometimes people have it at the market, but it's very, uh, um, there's not a continuous supply, but we're hoping to work with producers and improve that situation. And, and do we have a current, are, are we meeting the demand? Do we have enough meat to meet the demand right now? Well, um, this week, one of the producers that had their chickens process was quite concerned because they'd sold them all and realized they didn't have any left from themselves. So probably we're not. <laughs> not enough demand. Thank you so much, Anne. We should probably move ahead with the poll. Erin Ann. Okay, so take a look at that and what factors inform your choices when you produce meat products. Go ahead and fill out any and all of those.
And Erin Ann will tell us what the poll showed, the results. Just got a few more votes coming in. Okay. And I'm gonna end the poll now. You can see the results. So it looks like people are willing to pay a premium for locally produced meat. That's good news, right, Anne? You can yeah. make some money for the avatar, I guess. <laughs> um, there was uh, almost 25% of people who don't eat meat. We've got um, people that are wanting to always buy local, no matter what the price. So those two questions in the middle there really show that there's a high support for, for local meat. Thanks, everybody. Great, thank you. Okay, let's move to Patricia Reichert now. Patricia is the project manager in the development of the route. She's a local food system specialist and Patricia is working with communities to create robust local food economies. She's passionate about supporting community change based on values of sustainability, diversity, and equity. She believes that placing local values at the center of our food system is a core priority. Patricia is also one of the lead researchers and facilitator at, of Closing the Supply Gap, a collaborative initiative that is changing the local food system across the capital region. So go ahead, Patricia, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Bobby, and thank you, thank you, Patty, and for your invocation, and thank you, Erin Ann, and thank you, thank you. I, it is a real privilege to, to be here. Can everybody see in the, the presentation up on the screen? Can you see it, Erin Ann? Is it working? Looks good to yes. me. Okay, thank you. So, um, yeah, so I'm, I'm the president of the Salt Spring Island Farmland Trust and have been on the board for a while through, um, through some, some really beginnings of its development, development years um, on Salt Spring. It's a, it is in the province a unique farmland trust that is involved in, um, in a lot of action to a lot of change to create and support action in the community. And my presentation this evening is really focused on the importance of community. That community matters. And uh, as Bobby said, I have a real passion for being clear about what our values are as we do this work. Because local food and local food systems are not necessarily inherently different from industrial food systems. It, the difference is in the values that we bring to them. And, um, and so we, and, and that lies in our choices and our willingness and, and, and ability and good hearts to work together for to achieve something. And this community has a really strong history of doing that. So we stand on the shoulders of many good people as we move forward in, in, in changing our local food system so that mostly we're eating local and localized food. The difference being that localized is right in, right in our place here in this community and local can reach a little bit further, but always with, as Anne mentioned, that, that um, exercising our, our um, ability and our capacity to choose. So um, we, we can go over to Vancouver Island for things that we don't produce here and we can, we can go some other places that are sort of within our locale. But always, it's uh, it's what values we place are embedded in the food choices that we make. So that's where I'm that's where I'm coming from in my presentation this evening. And this has to do with the root, which is a new thing on Salt Spring. It's 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 a birthing process, uh, and it, and that and that process is still in play. So um, so 
as a community, we have choices we can still make. We have been making all along about the route and, and still choices to be made. So, um, so what, what I'll, I'll just, I'll start with what the, the route is about so that we kind of all get to, to uh, at least a basic level of what the heck I'm talking about. The route is a place and it's located at 189 Bettis Road. And if you drive down Bettis Road, it's just absolutely next door, shares a property line with Bettis Garage. So there are a lot of vehicles on the road around there not, not because of the route, but it does help you to slow down around there so that you can actually take a glance if you're heading south to your, to your right, I have to do that because I'm a bit dyslexic, or to your left if you're heading, heading north into town. The route is all about providing local food storage, processing, and education. And the storage, I'm gonna be just quite thematic here. The storage is temperature controlled, uh, local food storage that will allow us as a community uh, to have food available 12 months of the year. That's the objective. Lots of food 12 months of the year. It is also uh, going to provide uh, food processing, uh, a food processing facility, um, which will do some of the important things that we are missing now as a community in terms of developing our food system. So it will, and, and I've, I'm showing on the screen some examples and these are really just take them as examples just to get your, your hearts and minds working as to what is possible when we have this kind of facility operating. So it will, it will enable us to, to um, have small scale food processors in our community incubate new products. They'll be able to come in and test and produce and, and work with some chef experts in, in that area and, uh, and produce some really nice processed products for us. It'll, it'll allow gardeners who have large crops uh, to participate in community processing days probably not so important for people who can who can process their their abundance the abundance of their crops in a pot on their stove at home but if if you have much more if you've grown much more then don't let it go to waste um, you'll be able to come in and and, and uh, process it there we'll have processing days um, it will allow farmers to do light processing, recognizing that most farmers are in the business of farming because they want to farm. Uh, they don't want to be food processors necessarily. They, they want to be farmers, and that really is a full-time occupation. But they can do light processing, such which, which would come into the category of washing and packaging greens in a certified health facility, in a, in a facility that's been certified. Uh, by the by, uh, Island Health. Um, it would allow them to freeze and package berries when they have an abundance. So when that strawberry crop comes in and, and you can't necessarily sell it all, or it's a really lucrative crop, if only you could flash freeze it and package it properly and, and, and keep it in frozen storage and then sell it out um, in, uh, you know, in, in packages, depending on your marketing methods, or even to the grocery stores. So that will be possible with the route. It could allow um, farmers to come in and, and flash freeze uh, tomatoes. And again, the, the storage could happen right there at the same facility. You could come in with your crop and, and you could uh, clean it up flash freeze it, take it to the freezer right on the facility, have it uh, labeled and stored appropriately until you're ready to use it. Or it could allow community groups to come in and prepare large quantities of food for community events. Um, so you don't have to do everything at the last minute when the squash is ready or when, uh, I don't know, any number of different vegetables are ready. You could come in and um, 
and anticipate that you want to hold an event in November. And so you come in and you prepare, you roast off those vegetables. You could even go so far as to make the soup, or you could come back later and make the soup if you wanted to. You could bake pies, large numbers of pies. Imagine the fall fair. Um, or, or you could do large batch products for fundraising. So that's all possible. And many more ideas, many more ideas are possible there. Um, the, the kitchen that we're setting up at the root has equipment in it that doesn't exist in any other, in any other facility on the island. So it's not a home style cooking range. It's a, it's a full on commercial processing uh, oven is what it is. It's a combination uh, steam and uh, steam and, and convection oven that's really state of the art in terms of doing large batch kind of, kind of cooking. So different from, from what we're, we're used to and have available to us. So it'll increase capacity uh, of what we can do on the island. It, it, the, the route is also an education center. Education is a really important part of the Farmland Trust's mission and objectives and purposes as a charitable organization is to provide a strong educational program. And things that would fall under that category in terms of the route are we'll, we'll be offering a kitchen fundamentals training program for people who are interested in working in a food business. And the catch for us, and there is a catch, is that in doing that, you will learn about local food the food that you'll be handling will not be coming off the Cisco truck, but rather coming out of farms and gardens on the island. And that's an important thing. We've talked to Vancouver Island University about it and Camosun College, and it's an, an important addition to, uh, to what they can provide or what they are providing now. Um, it, it, it will, will, we can set up a growing chefs program for youth. There's a program in the province and we'll be able to offer that here on Salt Spring as well. There can be community shared learning about regenerative agriculture. The property is small. It's only one and a half acres, but we can demonstrate what regenerative agriculture means and people can come and learn about it. And we have many experts on the island. So, uh, and many different ways of looking at regenerative agriculture, which is fundamental to taking climate action and we can learn about it together. It'll provide some how-to courses and you can see the list there. Um, and, uh, and it will allow us to experiment with new plants in a, in a changing and challenging climate. Those are the kinds of things that, that the, those are the things that the route is about. Now, those of you who haven't been down Bettis Road and given the nod off to the left to the right to, to have a look at the facility, um, you will see prominent on the property two, two large buildings. Um, one is brand new and one has been refurbished. But important as those buildings are, the route is about more than just the buildings. It really is critical to the fabric of the community and to our resilience. And I guess to our having some sovereignty or control over our food system. Oh, sorry, jumped ahead. And I, I wanna take you back now to, to kind of, because of my, my theme as people, and, and how we do that together. I wanna to take you back through time uh, where the roots started from. It wasn't a bright idea out of one person's head. It was something that emerged from a whole community effort. And so just going from the, the building of this facility to where uh, it's it sort of back to where we, we broke ground. We have, I have there a picture of when the foundation for the new building was laid. And we have the Salt Spring Foundation there because they gave us, they gave the Farmland Trust the first uh, Shaw family bequest grant that they had given out of that fund to any organization on the island. They gave it to the route to get started on the new building. And because of that, we are gonna be happy to name that the 
the kitchen in the route, the Shaw family kitchen. Uh, and we have a couple of board members there and a couple of people from the foundation and also the builder who, the, who we worked with. Um, and then I, and then the other picture on the right hand side is the day that uh, Pete Schur, the electrician working on the property, laid the, the, the cable for the, um, for the three phase hydro and for the water system in uh, on the underground cable for all of that. And we got the, the first deluge of rain came down that day and turned into snow. And that was just before COVID hit us. And, um, and that the laying of that cable, we were able to do that with a grant from the community um, works fund. The Community Works Fund has also provided us with funding for our septic system, which I don't have a photograph of in here, but which is a unique septic system responding to a number of issues on the property that we had to deal with. It wasn't easy putting a septic onto that property with a well and riparian issues and all uh, just a, a host of, of issues. Anyway, that's that's where we were. Um, and then, but even before that, the first thing we did when we received the property after the development permit was approved was to refurbish the barn that was on the property and all the siding came off and uh, we, um, we salvaged the siding, the cedar siding that was still good and a group of volunteers came in and and uh, applied some preservative to that. And Anne will remember those days and there may be other people uh, in on this, uh, on this presentation who were also there helping out getting the siding uh, done. We had a contractor who was doing the rest of the work, but we took on the, the siding refurbishment. And on in the middle picture, uh, there's a picture, uh, once the barn was, was redone, um, we, uh, we built in this community seed bank into that barn. And that was done in combination with the Seed Sanctuary Society. And you see Jan Dan Jason there talking to a, a group of people and, and telling them about the, the community seed bank. And that's in the barn at the root and has been operating for, for a while now. And it is overseen by the Seed Sanctuary Society entirely. So we're very happy to be partners with that organization and all the people in that group who do wonderful work. And then on the very right hand side is a picture of the Minister of Agriculture, uh, Lana Popham and our MLA, Adam Olson, and a couple of board members, including Michael Hogan, who had the, the, the local butcher shop that Anne referred to in her presentation. And, and they, they were happy to come to the route and see what we were doing. And that since then, the Minister of Agriculture has been instrumental in approving funding for a number of food centers and local food hubs around the province. And Salt Spring, uh, unfortunately, we were, we were too early. We we were ahead of we were ahead of the curve, darn it, and um, and so we were already beyond what we could uh, what, the, what the funding was for those that development. But uh, we do have Lana to thank for uh, for for uh, the work she's doing to support local agriculture. That's for sure. Uh, and going back even a bit further, we received title to the property in 2012 at the Farmland Trust, but that was really because of the work of a whole bunch of community people who, who were involved in, um, in acquiring this piece of property for, the communi for community benefit to build a local food centre. And the picture there is of Mike Lakin, who was the vice president of the Farmland Trust, and I was privileged to work with uh, putting up putting up a sign for an open house we were holding. Once the property was uh, established, or the, the all of the um, the uh, uh, what am I, the zoning was, was dealt with. The Agriculture Land Commission is the one that required that the piece be donated to the community. And then the, the local 
agricultural organizations on the island, the Alliance and the Farmers Institute and Island Natural Growers asked the Farmland Trust if we would take ownership of that property and develop it. And, and the Farmland Trust agreed, if, uh, as you can see, because we're doing it. Um, here's, a, here's a picture of a, a sunny day in October that was flanked on both sides by deluges of rain, but we had organized an open house so that people could come and see the property. And in the foreground here, you see, um, uh, uh, oh my God, now I completely forgot his name, who I know very well, Donald Gunn, thank you. Um, so Donald Gunn there is, is showing the development of the whole site to a group of people who were coming to tour and um, he, he designed the new building. So we thank Donald Gunn and all of his work that he's contributed. And even before all of that, all of that stuff was done in this community to make all of that happen. And it began with the food security plan in 2006 that identified the importance of establishing a community food center on the island. And that it was a little bit vague at that point and all of that got solidified when the area farm plan was done in 2008 and building a, a, a infrastructure that would support agriculture and the development of a strong food system on the island went into the area farm plan and and uh, a facility like the root was identified as one of the top three recommendations in the area farm plan in 2008. There were also uh, studies that were done around the need for this, which Anne has mentioned, produce studies as well as livestock studies. And, and it, you, you can see there were hundreds of people who turned out to, uh, to support the planning of the area farm plan. And, and, and strong, strong thinking went into all of it. There's also been strong regional and provincial support for what we're doing and a number of needs assessment studies, a feasibility study. And one of the studies that we, that we did with farmers showed that 85% of farmers identified the need for shared storage. It's very expensive to build individual storage on farms and shared storage is a, an effective way of going about that for small scale farmers. 78% said a processing kitchen is important and, and almost the equal number said freezing space is important and so on and so forth. So, so a lot of work went into all of that and we thank all the people who contributed to that information gathering. It's important to build community to build these things based on community interests, needs, and strengths. Um, so the root is part of a system solution to building a robust local food system. It's, it's, it's part of that. And, and bringing it up to cur current planning, the current Climate Action Plan 2.0 is addressing ecological priorities and has a strong section in it on food and agriculture. And the root is mentioned in there as an important piece in achieving our cl climate action goals as a community. The area farm plan renewal, which renews the 2008 plan, also identifies the route and the importance of inc its importance in increasing local food production. And, and COVID renewal objectives have also identified building a more robust local food economy, needing to increase um, infrastructure on uh, in the community so that we can increase their food production, the two go hand in hand. So that brings us right up to the present. And there's one more bit that I wanna mention and that has to do with the overall role of the Farmland Trust in local food. We, uh, the Farmland Trust, uh, thanks to this community, owns the Bourgoyne Valley Community Farm and has owned it since 2012 which was a very rough, rough, maybe not very nutritious hayfield for many, many years. And within a couple of years, we turned it into a very productive food producing area and um, a, a food producing farm. We now have 88 allotment gardens on that farm this year. Uh, 88 families are gardening there. 
and we have four very strong active farmers also on that land and Kaylee who's going to be speaking next is one of those farmers with heavenly roots there are three others and there's also community services um uh food uh, uh, harvest farm that's the name of it on on that farm so we took 62 acres and have turned it into a really amazing food producing area and we've improved the ecological conditions of that farm in the process uh sorry i flipped my where did i go oh here we go back to and i just wanted to draw attention that recently on the farm, the community energy group put up solar panels on the the um, cover there that we have the the picnic area that we have established on the farm. They put up the solar panels and set up uh, set up the the electrical use on the farm for net metering and uh, EV. Uh, charging and also bicycle charging. And that's the group there. None of that, that would not exist if it weren't for those people in that picture. Um, so making the route the best it can be, we want you, I invite you all to, to watch for the soft opening because of COVID, we'll probably have to do the opening that we're planning for this year. And no, I don't have a date yet, uh, but um, we're, we're probably going to have to do it in bits and pieces rather than one gigantic event. Um, and what you see there is a picture of the building from the from this kitchen side. So the building is set up such that the it's on three floors. The bottom floor is the storage area and it's burned in. So we get the most benefit from from the uh, from burning it in. Um, everything about the route is doing the best it can to achieve climate action goals and pay attention to how we're using the property in a responsible way. So the kitchen, the whole kitchen area is, um, is on that, this second level, which you see there with the, with the white doors. Um, and on the right hand side, you see the third level up there in the corner, the staircase goes up, that's an apartment. So we have a two bedroom housing unit also on the property. This is just a 1.6 acre property, remember. And the people that, that you see here in the photo are doing some planting on the property for us. And again, they are all volunteers. They have come in to help while we're while we're working to develop the whole rest of the property into food production. It's really quite amazing. And you'll get to see it when you come to the soft opening and, and Transition Salt Spring will be able to help us, I'm sure, I'm hoping, fingers crossed, with, the, uh, with letting everybody know about how we're gonna go about that so that you can come, we can all come and celebrate together in parts. So back to where I started from, and that programming bit, programs and services, there's a lot of very concrete stuff going on, but all of it, absolutely all of it, relates back to working as a community. I hope, Bobby, that I haven't gone over time. Just a little bit, but we'll look at that. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> um, Deborah, let's just take one question. I want to make sure there's enough time for Kaylee, but let's take one yeah. question now. And then at the end, Patricia, there's quite a bit more questions. So I'm hoping we get a chance to get back to you. Okay, thank so you. Jen Jennifer asked first, does the root have all the funding it needed? needs? Oh, big question, Jennifer. Well, I don't know of any nonprofit and certainly not a charitable one that has all the funding that it needs. But, um, you know, we're, we're doing we're kind of going step by step. We're so far on budget and um, we've sacrificed time a little bit to be on budget. But um, we can always, always um, use donations in a very productive way if anybody is interested in helping out. We've been really lucky through time. We've had Victoria Foundation, Van City, Van City Credit Union, um, the Community Works Project, the Farmers Institute, Island Natural Growers, Windsor Plywood. Like we have donors, provincial government, 
we have had really, really nice, it's been a lot of work because we didn't get one single lump of money. Uh, that would have been a whole lot easier. But, um, but you know, we, we people have been generous with us. We have a private donor, a couple of private donors have been exceedingly generous. So we certainly can't complain, but there's more work to be done. So Great. help is okay. always good. Yeah, thank you. Okay, let's take a look at the poll for Patricia's group discussion. Okay, what kind of local food skills are you interested in learning? Well, this is good. Thank you, Kaylee, for putting these questions together. <laughs> I'm sorry I got I got involved in other work and didn't. This is very good. While we're waiting for the poll answers, I would like to let everyone know that if we're unable to get to everyone's questions, we really are going to do our best to have them answered by our wonderful panelists in a follow up email. And, and TSS will also send along a lot of helpful links to access local food. Um, if you haven't joined Transition Salt Springs mailing list, I really do recommend you do, um, merely because we can keep you posted with updates and sharing some of these incredible resources and volunteer opportunities, etc. So we've just got a few more votes coming in. We'll close it in three, two, one. So our top answer was best harvest practices for extended storage. That's interesting. Uh, Next was how to grow food organically with permaculture culture techniques and how to extend the food season, how to preserve and can. So yeah, it looks like there's gonna be a lot of a lot of value coming for a lot of people. Out of what I can't wait to offer. to open up and start working, that'd be great. Okay, next we have Kaylee Barton's gonna talk. She's our representative for the farmers on the island. And she is part of a farming couple from Heavenly Roots Farm. And she is on that leased land that um, Patricia just talked about. They market their produce through weekly farmers markets, a CSA program, a market club, which I just bought into. And they sell wholesale to stores, restaurants, and caterers. If she, and if that's not busy enough for her, she's also on the board for the Community Market Society, the Salt Spring Farmland Trust Society, and she also helps coordinate the annual CD Saturday um, Festival. So go ahead, Kaylee, thanks. Um, thank you, Bobby. I'll just take a moment to share my screen with everyone. Okay, can everyone see it? Yes. Okay, awesome, and you can hear me fine. Okay, good. Um, so I just wanted to thank Pat and Anne for sharing first. Um, I really enjoyed your presentations and I've looked up to both of them for a really long time. And I'd like to note that 2012 was an exciting year on Salt Spring Island. That's the year I came here. It sounds like that's the year that the Farmlands Trust and the Abattoir both had a lot happening too. So very cool. So first of all, my presentation is called How to Find Local Food on Salt Spring Island. And I just wanted to share with everyone all of the different ways that local food is being sold and shared and help people to find the right option for themselves. So here we go. So why buy local? I'm not gonna spend too much time here because I think I'm preaching to the choir a little bit here, but um, much like what Anne was saying about our industrial farm system with meat, it's very similar with um, produce and fruit farming. Um, on the island, we have really um, forward-thinking farmers who are always 
studying and learning the best ways to do things with ecology in mind. So um, it's like a climate smart style of farming. Most of the farmers here are starting to reduce tillage. They're using a lot of compost, cover cropping, um, covering the soil is a major one. So using mulch or compost as a mulch. And um, all of these practices really help to encourage soil health. So that's what we're all about doing. It's a slower process. It takes more manpower, um, but the product is great. It's good for you and it's good for the soil too. So especially cover cropping and composting, those practices will draw carbon from the atmosphere and store it in the soil. So that's a really good reason to choose local, um, especially with farmers who are reducing their tillage. Um, that's one of the big ways that carbon is released from the soil. So ask your farmer if they're tilling and how often. I think that's really important. Um, so we're talking about adopting a plant-based diet or eating lower on the food chain. So eating less meat that's produced industrially and eating more plants. It's going to be healthy for you and healthy for the planet. Um, and I'm mentioning community action, health and well-being too, because our local food system is about more than just what we're feeding our bodies, it's also about our culture. So when we eat local food, we're connecting to the seasons with the land and with our community members. And we're doing it like they did in the old days where the festivals are around food and times of the year. So you get more meaning in terms of your time spent with people and your time spent with the food you're eating. Um, not to mention that it's healthy. So community action, I'm including too, because local farmers tend to be interested in donating food as well as selling it. Um, and supporting farmers means creating employment, actually. Um, that's our job. So it's a nice thing to do as well. Um, and I mentioned this a little bit, but we're finding common ground through food. So if you're eating food that's grown locally, you are sharing it with people who are close by. And it's one thing that people tend to not argue about. A really good meal is like, it's just good. Like people have different tastes, but um, there's not a lot of politics around like something that tastes yummy. So, you know, some people like salad and some people don't, but. To me, I think there's not a lot to argue about, which is important to find this day and age. So, um, so de deciding on the right local food option for yourself is I think an important question if you're gonna try to eat more local is how do you work this into your life and make it easy to do? Because some of the options are going to be less convenient and people need to decide how um, convenient do they want their food purchasing world to be. Um, so these aren't necessarily in order of convenience, but um, these are the options we have on Salt Spring or the ones I'm aware of, I'm sure there's more. Um, so we've got local stores, the farmer's market, farm stands, online ordering of which there's lots of options and CSA programs of multiple varieties. And so some farms do many of these, some farms do only one or two. Um, and it's up to you, I guess, to find out which one is your favorite. And here's the thing to consider. So last year, we saw a huge uptick in CSA memberships, all of the farms on the island. And um, that was a good thing to do during the circumstances because people were worried about where food was coming from. And they thought, oh, I better pre-buy it and make sure I've got it. Um, but over the year, I think, CSA is not for everybody and most food options are not for everybody. So think about your schedule, your food budget, how many people you're feeding, so how much you're gonna get. Um, how committed are you to the local food diet? Do you really need every meal of the day to be local or is it more something you do when you're celebrating? Your travel plans, are you gonna be away? So do you need more flexibility? Do you have food preservation plans? So are you someone who is gonna make pickles every year or you're gonna do lots of jam or kimchi, these things? How do you cook and what do you eat? And then your food restrictions, allergies, and your likes and dislikes. The different food purchasing models are gonna be better for you depending on your answers to these things. And uh, I think I can help match you up with the right style. I'll try my best. Uh, 
okay, so first option, local stores. I think this is probably the most convenient because we're all buying all of our basics that we need at the stores. And um, one wonderful thing that's happened over the last couple of years is that um, grocery stores have been stocking a lot more local food. And that takes me back to what Anne was saying, which I wrote down because I thought it was a really good quote. The consumer has the power to change the system by the choices they make. And one place we really saw that um, over the last three or four years is at Country Grocer. They started stocking local produce. And there was one produce manager who was very passionate about that. And he really tried to make it happen um, in concert with local farmers. And actually, the community responded really well. And um, so the produce department just kept asking for more and they would put it out and see if it sold. And if it did, they would ask for more. So now what you see is that pretty much all year round, they've got a lot of salad, especially. Um, but they're ordering all kinds of produce from farms and putting it out and seeing what happens. So thanks to everyone who shops at Country Grocer. Um, Nature Works has always sold local produce, as far as I know. And they also sell meat. So I noticed someone was asking where you can get meat. Um, you can get it at Nature Works and Country Grocer. And um, the Salt Spring Mercantile is stocking local food too. Um, so if you're in the South End, that's a good place to go. And I put a little disclaimer here in the corner. You will get the best price from farmers if you buy direct from them. So when there's someone else that is in between you and a farmer, they're going to mark it up. So the price might be higher, but it is also more convenient to get it from them. So anytime you want to walk into the store, it'll be there for you. Um, here's the second slide. Excuse me. So community supported agriculture is probably the farmer's favorite, depending on who you ask. Um, the reason it's so great is that it helps you to plan. Farming is a very um, uncertain profession. Um, usually you're just uh, growing things, taking the risk and seeing who wants it. With CSA, people are just telling you right up front that they want what you have. And then you're freed up just to grow what you need to support that number of people. So it takes a lot of guesswork out of it. And it also forms that baseline where farmers feel supported to make all the choices of putting crops in the ground. So that's a really nice way to tell your farmer, hey, I want you to be here. I want you to do this for me. And then it takes the pressure off. So the way CSA works, if anyone's not familiar, is that you pre-purchase um, food from the farmer, usually in the springtime, and then there is generally a weekly box is made. And I've written at the bottom here, are you flexible? Because most CSAs will be seasonal in nature and whatever is abundant and the time is going in the box. Usually you'll get more than what you've paid for, which is kind of the trade-off. Um, the boxes are having more food than what they would be at market. Um, so that's a perk as well. Um, and questions to ask before you think about signing up for a CSA. Does the time and the location work for you? Are you willing to take produce that maybe weren't your top favorite? Or would you take the same thing three weeks in a row? How much do you like to cook? Um, I usually tell people if you're cooking a meal from scratch about three times a week, it's a good choice for you. Um, and different farms have different sizes of box too. So you can ask about how much food is going to be in a weekly share and kind of gauge whether or not that's gonna work for you. Um, the most common complaint in CSA shares is either that there weren't a, enough of the things that were your favorite or there were too many of certain things or that you have a lot left over. So if you're considering a CSA, I would recommend it to people who really like to preserve or they like to process things into other things. So kind of have in mind, what would you do if you had too many cherry tomatoes? What would you do if you had too much kale? If you can answer that question really easily, then community supported agriculture is a great choice. Uh, so another one we're all familiar with is the farmer's market. And this is the one that I think has the most to offer in terms of culture. You go to the farmer's market and it's fun and you meet all your friends and it's very social. 
Um, there's a lot of conversations about food at the market. Um, and you can get a lot of good growing tips, cooking tips. Um, and it's also visually really appealing. So if you want to go and kind of feel like you're having a special experience, I think the market is the place to go. Farmers are usually going to bring a lot of the variety that they have. Probably everything that's in season is on the table. So if you're someone who wants something different every time, the market is great. And you can also shop at multiple farms. And a lot of people really appreciate that that it's not a relationship with just one farm, it's a relationship with all of them potentially. Um, and it's also good if you're the kind of person who doesn't eat much or you're only interested in certain things. So if you do have food allergies or if there's certain crops that you just don't enjoy or you're just thinking, oh, I never wanna get beets, um, then go to the market and choose whatever you like and spend as much as you feel like you want to. So there's no commitment. You just go and choose what you want to choose, which is awesome. And uh, here's some great photos of the farmer's market. It's always so stunning. And it's a bit like going to the art gallery on Salt Spring. They really, people try their best to make it very beautiful. So you're also getting that too, for free. Um, so there is a market CSA hybrid model and a lot of farmers are doing this now um, in an effort to like create some of the benefits of both models at once. So, um, and there's different ways that it can be done. What we do is a market club. So people will pay in advance, just like a CSA, but there's no commitment. There's no, um, there's no special time that you have to be there. You can come to one market and not the next one. You can save up all of your market share and spend it all on strawberries. Um, so it's very flexible that way. Um, and I know some other farmers do this as well. Um, and then there's also something more like a lo loyalty program, like you might have at a cafe where you have like a little punch card. So some farmers will have that and you can ask them about it. Um, and it's usually, oh, buy, buy 10 times and get something free the 10th time, that kind of thing. Um, so farm stands. Last year was a cool year for farm stands. I don't know, probably a lot of you had checked it out this year. Um, but because of COVID, I think a lot of people were seeing this as the best option for getting local food. Um, at a farm stand, it's unattended, which was actually a plus when we were needing to distance one another. Um, so yeah, farm stand, you just walk up um, from the road and see what's available. And um, I had noticed that farm stands were kind of waning in popularity up until 2019, but it was so cool to see all of the farm stands back in business over the last year. And I think that that will continue, which is really exciting. Um, there's two places that are really great to look to get information about farm stands, because some of them are open on certain days and not on others, but some are open, excuse me, all week. Um, everyone here I'm sure is on the Salt Spring Exchange, but if you go to the farming and farm stands category, you'll always see what people are posting. And um, one of the best things that happened last year was this Facebook group. So if you're on Facebook, I really encourage everyone to join this. Uh, farm stands, farmers and foodies of Salt Spring Island. It's amazing. People are posting pretty much every day um, when their farm stand's going to be open, great photos of food, lots of unique products, um, baking, farming, um, plant, like plant sales, all kinds of stuff. So that was very cool. And even there's some community organizing happening through this Facebook group, which is fun, like farm stand tours that are themed. I know there was one for Christmas, and we also did one for CD Saturday because we can have an an event. So check that out. There's a lot happening. It's very active. And basically whatever you're looking for local food is on there, like eggs or baking or produce. And I'm also suggesting just go for a drive and see what's out there. Okay, so ordering online. This is also kind of new over the last little while. Um, and again, the pluses are to avoid lineups or going into stores which was a benefit given the global situation, but also just convenient as well. And um, you can buy what you want. 
whenever you feel like it. Um, and there's pickup options. So that usually is set up by the farmer or producer, the best day to pick up. So I've listed a few that I know about and there may actually be more, um, but Local Line was one that approached the Community Market Society last year and offered the service for free. And it works just like an online shop. So as a customer, you make a profile, um, you register, and then you can view all the products that are available and you can use that platform to pay for things and then arrange pickup. So that's very convenient. And um, actually I'm going to attach a handout for you with all of these um, websites on it. So don't worry about taking notes. I'll send something out to everyone. Um, local Salt is very cool. It's a new app that was founded by a local salt springer and um, she's just launched it this spring. So this is also an online shop that has Salt Spring Island produce and also like baking and preserves. And again, the producers can just make a shop online and post their products. And as a customer, you can go on there and use your credit card or a debit card just to pay. So it's really easy. There's no like e-transfers or passwords or anything like that. Um, very convenient. And um, I'm putting down Salt Spring Meats as well. Um, it's a directory of meat producers. So what you'll find there is a profile for different people who will grow livestock and you can get their contact information. So it's not like um, an online shop where you can directly buy, but it does give you an idea of who's growing what and how to contact them. And so these are two local food delivery options, which I would put at the top of my convenience list. Um, the Food Free Rangers is one a lot of you might not know about. It's created by Ronnie Dunkley. And she's been really great to work with for the local farmers. She'll just ask what we've got each week and then um, put it into her email list. So it's a really simple system. She just emails a list of people what's available. You make an order and then you pick it up in a couple of days. Or sorry, she delivers it to you actually. So that's very nice. And then um, WAWI, which stands for We Are What We Eat, is a delivery meal service. And so they're actually making full meals um, and they're using local produce. So that's interesting too. Um, I couldn't go on this um, panel without suggesting that everyone grows their own food a little bit too, if they can, um, or find a place where you can do a bit of gardening best way to connect with your um, food that you eat is to grow some or try it out or volunteer on a farm. Um, and part of this, I wanted to talk about this a lot, but I'm really happy that Let's Grow Together is a panel that's happening later. So I don't have to get too into it. Um, but when you're gardening, you're making choices about ecology too. So we talk a lot about food choices, but there's also good garden choices you can make. So the way that you do your gardening is important, um, like using organic amendments and not using pesticides, using mulches, covering your soil with either plants or mulch, um, planning for pollinators and reducing the amount that you're disturbing the soil. Um, so purchasing seeds and plants from local producers is a really good way as well. Um, just like all of the industrial food and farming systems, there's also that system for seeds. So keep that in mind that you'd like your seeds to be produced close to home too. Um, growing your own seeds is an incredible experience that I think all gardeners should try. And um, do check out the Salt Spring Seed Sanctuary. They have a really nice um, seed bank, which Patricia was talking about. And anyone can get involved to grow out seed varieties and bulk up the supply. So that's something I'm really excited to do. They have some wonderful varieties that are really good for the gardens and especially ones that have been grown on salt spring for a long time. So check that out. And lastly, here's some ways you can support farmers and the community. Um, one of them is to join a CSA. Um, for the customer, it's a way to get really nice local produce. For farmers, it's 
it's like having your bread and butter. Joining a CSA makes the whole season a little more comfortable. So definitely do that if you feel like it fits into your life. Um, you can also sponsor a CSA share and that's a way you can help other people in the community. A lot of farms will offer the option for you to buy a share for yourself and also for someone else. And often there are people in need who could really use that. So ask your farms about it. Um, talk to restaurants, cafes, and stores. This kind of um, word of mouth actually makes quite a big difference. If the restaurants and cafes are hearing that their customers want local food, they're gonna um, reach out and try to find it. So do the little elbow, nudge them into it. Um, and this one really matters too, is telling your local food story. So make a big deal about it. If you wanna grow and eat local food, um, put it in people's faces online or talk about it. And um, yeah, spread those good ideas. Um, now, three things to do if you wanna support really good local food programs. Um, making a donation if you feel like you have the capacity um, to the Farmlands Trust and the Abattoir Society, who we heard about today, doing wonderful work in the community. And I also wanted to mention the Nutrition Coupon Program that's run by Community Services. So this is um, a provincially funded program, and they support low-income seniors and families to shop at the farmer's market. So they're given coupons, which are um, exchanged, and the farmers get um, the money for the produce that they've given. So it's a really, really great program and feeds a lot of people and provides that community to those who might not feel like they can afford to shop at the farmer's market. So the next slide is just a little more information about that. So who it's for, families, seniors, and farmers. And they're getting $21 a week so they can spend it on meat, eggs, and produce. And that's how you can um, donate to it. And the donation of $462 um, supports someone for 22 weeks to eat local food. So definitely go for it if you have a little extra in your pocket. Um, and lastly, feel free to get in touch anytime you want to talk more about this stuff. It's what I'm passionate about. So uh, don't be shy. You can ask me questions today or another day. There's my email. Thanks. Thank you so much, Kaylee. Let's take a look at some questions. I think we have time for about two questions, Deborah, for um, Kaylee. Uh, there's so much support for Kaylee and everything she talked about, but no questions so far. Maybe we'll have some, but nothing yet. I could, yes, we can go backwards to other people, but Kaylee, you summed up everything so well. Thank you. Thank you. Great, thank non -controversial. you. Non-controversial. <laughs> <laughs> Let, let's go ahead to the poll then, and then come back to questions in, in general. Where do you access local food? Just at 80% voted. I'll give a couple more seconds. Any last voters? We'll end in three, two, one. I grow myself. All right. To go yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> came up on top at 85% and uh, people growing That's and trading amazing. with friends. Yeah, uh, lots of support for a farmer's market and local food at the grocery stores, farm stands, CSA, yeah. A few people are using the online platform that became popular last year. Mm -hmm. Thanks everybody.
I really want to thank um, Anne, Patricia, and Kaylee for the time and the great information. You guys have answered a lot of my questions. Uh, so I've learned a lot this evening. Um, let's go to the chat in general, because I know there was questions to the other people didn't get to get asked. So Deborah, did you want to do that? Uh, I yes. There were several, especially for Patricia. Um, someone wants to know if you could take unprocessed food uh, to the uh, um, root and um, sorry, processed foods that are not locally grown. That's the point of it, I think. Like, for example, if you wanted to make granola and the products weren't grown on the island, could you do that? Oh, yeah, I, I think I understand where the question's coming from. And I, I, I'm, I have to say that we, we really are focused on local. So, um, oh, that's a tough, that is so tough. I don't want to discourage anybody from learning how to make their own food. That's, that is the thing, it, processing your own food. At this point, though, as we get started with the root, we're going to put emphasis on local ingredients and then kind of pick and choose as we go along what people really want. Uh, uh, more than that. So it's a maybe, I guess. I guess the answer is a maybe. Yeah, sorry. Sorry for not being more definitive, but well, uh, maybe we have I'll... a bias to local food, I have to tell you. We're a bit of evangelistic about it. I'm sorry. I'm not. Erin <laughs> uh, Ann wants to know if, uh, if you would um, entertain rentals Rentals, as in um, rent. If would you rent the space, and then someone could use non-local foods, or they could do their own thing. Would it be rental uh, appropriate? It. You know, um, I hate to say what the root is not, but but it, this this kind of brings it up. the The root is the root is not a. We call that a commissary kitchen. Uh, where you just rent the space and and you come in and you use it and there are places commissary kitchens in Vancouver, for example, which are very suitable to uh, to people who want to make a product any product and all they're really renting is uh, is the, the the equipment and the space to do that. Um, the route at this point has a has more of a mission in terms of uh, ensuring that there's good general community access and that the things that are going on at the root are really benefiting the community as a whole. That's a little bit hard to explain, I know, and I'm doing a terrible job of it at this point. But, um, but um, as, as time goes on, there might be room for that. And maybe what I'm mumbling about is the importance that as we start the route, we're gonna to have to start it slow and sure and get legs under us so that we get experience in doing what we're doing a small number of things really well, and then moving on to other things and entertaining more, maybe more, um, more broad kinds of ideas. At, at this point, we're going to really try and, and drill down really thoroughly in terms of exploring what we need here in this community in order to advance local food and, and, and the, the things that are needed to support that. So that's going to be the priority to begin with. But you know, in the end, it's really, I come back to that thing about the community. Um, uh, the, the, this, this is a place that's for the benefit of the community. And so we'll work, we'll work from that perspective. Always lots of conversation, never shut off the conversation, please yeah, bring the idea forward so that it can be thought about. Pamela would like to know if there will be a store on site. You know, the zoning allows for a, for a, a, a winter market. Uh, at the root, when when the clever people who developed the zoning for this property uh, did that work, they tried to imagine anything and everything that could be uh, useful there and included in the zoning. 
for the property. So that's how we got the residential unit. Very smart, I think. And, and look, uh, you know, that was a while ago that that zoning was done. And, um, and but anticipation that every new building should have some housing in it. And the, and the availability of a market space is certainly a possibility at the route. Now there are other discussions in the community about about um, a market space that would accommodate winter or more year round kind of kind of se uh, uh, selling availability for farmers. So we'll just see where that goes and um, and and um, and see whether we can provide a service that's needed or whether somebody else is providing it. Yeah, we're not we're not there to do someone else out of what they also want to do. Um, so it'll, it's, it's, uh, it's an important point and, and a good one for more conversation. I'm being vague here, I know, but I, I, I don't mean to be. I just mean that, that conversation around those things is really important. Okay, Deborah, do we have, I think we have time for one more question. Okay, um, Becky wants to know the capacity of your freezer storage and is it for produce or for meat or for not for meat and fish or are meat and fish um, part of what could be frozen there? Uh, the, primary, the primary point of the route has to do with produce, but there's nothing to say that meat couldn't also be stored. And it is, it is walk-in freezer space, so I don't know the exact area of it. The whole bottom floor, so the footprint of that building is a thousand square feet. And so each floor, once building is taken into account, is just just around 900 and some square feet, and and a good chunk of that is freezer space, and the other part of the storage is chilling space, and then there's ambient temper, temperature space. So we we've got the three things going on in that in that area. So the freezer space is pretty big, and we have room on the property and plans that we can add container space as the community needs that. So there could be freezer space added in as well. Yeah, so wouldn't wouldn't rule out meat at all. Yeah, if it's local meat. I'm gonna sneak one final question in that because Erin um, Ann suggests asking you if the Farmland Trust is looking for board members. Uh, the Farmland Trust always welcomes new board members, uh, anybody who wants to put their name forward. And I really, really personally, having been on the board a while and having been on the board, and I wasn't on the original board, but I know this is a lot, of, it's, it's, it's a really good commitment to make um, to, to be on the board of this kind of facility. It's not for the faint of heart, I might say, because there is work involved. Um, but you know, there aren't very many boards you can go on on this island that uh, that where there isn't work involved. So, so I, we we don't stand out. We're certainly not unique in that regard. But um, anybody who wants to get involved in in governance uh, with uh, with the farmland trust, I, I'd be happy, happy, happy to have them step forward and make themselves known. That would be great. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, thanks. Well, I want to thank everyone again especially those who helped me with putting this on. And um, let's see, Erin Ann or Patty, do you have anything else you'd like to say? I guess not. Then have a good evening. Thank you so much. Good night. Thank Thanks, you everyone. Thanks. Thank you.